Hello and welcome to the live broadcast of Divine Mercy Sunday Celebration here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stackbridge, Massachusetts. I'm Father Joseph Roche. I'm a member of the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception. And with me today is my fellow Marian, Father Chris Alar. Welcome to the show, Father Chris. Thank you, Father Joe. As always, it's great to be back, even if the weather is a little less than what we hoped it would be with the rain. And, you know, God's ways are not always our ways. Tomorrow is supposed to be beautiful. <laughs> well, he pours out his mercy on us in all different ways. Uh, rain and snow, bless the Lord. Uh, you know, this year, Divine Mercy Sunday falls on the same date it did for St. Faustina in 1935, which is April 28th. That was the first Divine Mercy Sunday. Mm -hmm. And on that day, she wrote this diary passage. Toward the end of the service, I saw the Lord Jesus as he is represented in the image. I heard a voice. This feast emerged from the very depths of my mercy and it is confirmed in the vast depths of my tender mercies. Every soul believing and trusting in my mercy will obtain it. You know, no matter who you are, Father Joe, or what you've done, God's mercy is always waiting for us, waiting to be showered upon us. And a great example of that is in the confessional. And, you know, over the decades or centuries of our church, we've had some great confessors. And one of the best, I think, that comes to mind is Father St. John Vianney, a great priest in the uh, 1800s that brought God's mercy to so many people. You're right, Father Chris. We are especially blessed this year because the Knights of Columbus have brought the incorrupt heart of St. John Vianney which is currently on tour of the United States here to the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy for our pilgrims to venerate this weekend. He was known as the Curie of Ars. Uh, he was the pastor of a small parish in France where in the early 1800s, as you said, he helped renew the faith because it had almost been completely destroyed by the French Revolution at that time. Exactly. And, that, you know, people say that he spent up to 18 hours in the confessional. And so it's no wonder why we refer to him now as or look to him as the patron saint of parish priests. And on this tour, the faithful are asked to pray for their most heartfelt needs and intentions, as well as for healing within the heart of the church and the world. Exactly. And this leads us, I think, Father Joe, to a very powerful show again this year um, you know this this year we're focusing on God's healing mercy which is so needed right now the world obviously everybody knows this is hurting um, the wars the persecutions but you know some of these father I think are the worst we've seen in human history uh, the political division in our country now Democrats and Republicans have always disliked each other but to the level that we see today crazy uh, cr crisis in the church we've always had some of that but to the point that it is now now is even extreme um, suicide epidemic there's again always been suicides in, in our world but to this level that we're seeing like never before a lack of God in society we've just secularized ourselves and become materialistic and so it's it's the it all shows why there's such a clear and needed time of mercy right now and this message of mercy is needed now more than ever absolutely uh, this is there's so much rampant secularism we see today in the media outlets such as books and movies and TV shows, radio, etc. So in order to bring the message of divine mercy to the most people, we too need to use these very same media channels to grab everyone's attention. Exactly. And that's what our show is going to be about today, is how we use these channels of TV and movies, as well as radio, book, and even personal retreats with more of a one-on-one -on -one uniting with each other uh, to spread this message of God's healing mercy. Yeah, and each guest, in fact, that we will have will bring a better understanding to us and to our viewers of this power of divine mercy in this type of ministry. Speaking of television, this is exciting. We have uh, an announcement to make to you. Um, last year, we filmed after Divine Mercy Sunday, EWT on Cruise remained, and we filmed a new version, a video version of the Chaplet of Divine Mercy. And a lot of people have been asking about it, and it is now going to air this evening at 5.30 on EWTN. So we're very excited. In fact, let's take a look for a clip at a clip of it for our audience right now. Blood and water, which gush forth from the heart of Jesus as a fount of mercy for us. I trust in you.
So we're happy to use television, obviously, as a way to spread this message of mercy. And speaking of television, we also want to talk about movies. And regarding movies, we have a TV producer, a movie producer from Poland named Michael Kondrat. And he will be our first guest to introduce to us a movie he's been working on, along with our special guest, uh, Superior Father Kaz Fowlick. And... Uh also, on the second segment, we're going to have Father Don Calloway and our colleague Jason Lewis, who will join us to talk about new Marion Press books and projects that are in the works. Absolutely. And after that, we'll have Michael and Gail Meisner Elias, and they're going to talk to us about the healing that takes place through the Ministry of Retreats and Hospitality. And so we're excited to have them come on, and they're just down the road here from the Shrine of Divine Mercy. And finally, we'll have Teresa Tamio, a well-known author and EWTN host who also spreads the word through her very popular radio shows, and she's going to shed some light on how she uses this medium to help spread the healing message of mercy. That's right. So we have an exciting lineup, Father Joe, but before we do that and bring out our first guest, we want to share with you a short video that will tell you a little bit more of the ways that you can experience divine mercy right here at our shrine that a world so desperately needs it. For many years, the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception have been spreading the message of God's mercy to a world in desperate need of healing through every available channel, including printed media, film, outreach via missions and retreats, and radio. Regarding the printed word, the Marians have been publishing Catholic content since 1944. Every year, we print over 50 million pieces of material including millions of pamphlets, prayer cards, letters, and images. Also, every year, more than half a million books and more than half a million magazines are distributed. And our websites receive more than five million visitors annually. We've also distributed hundreds of millions of divine mercy images, just as our Lord requested through St. Faustina. In 1987, the same year we published St. Faustina's diary, we produced the film Divine Mercy, No Escape. It portrays the life of St. Faustina and found its way onto televisions and homes around the world. Movies about St. Faustina continue to touch hearts and minds. In fact, this year, we collaborated with Kondrat Media, a Polish production company, and will release a 90-minute docudrama on St. Faustina that has appeared at the Vatican and will appear in theaters worldwide. Of course, the Marians have a strong outreach to bring the message of divine mercy to people firsthand through retreats, conferences, parish missions, and many other ministries. We've been to just about every state in the Union and are making our way into Europe. There are also conferences and retreats held at our shrine in Stockbridge. Thousands of pilgrims visit the shrine annually. Many others who may be unable to attend these events reach out to our prayer line on Eden Hill, which receives more than one million intentions a year. Our Marian priests also spread the message of mercy through podcasts, SoundCloud, YouTube, various social media, and several Catholic radio networks. Although the channels vary, our message remains the same. Christ wants everyone in the world to experience the healing power of his divine mercy. Well, as you heard in that short video, uh, the Marians have collaborated with Kondrat Media on a film called Love and Mercy, which will open and premiere in the United States on September 13th this year, which is the anniversary of the revelation of the chaplet in 1937. Now we have as our guest the producer and director, Michael Kondrat, and our provincial superior, Father Kaz Fawik. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now, in addition to being shown at World Youth Day in Panama, this movie had quite an exciting premiere in Rome, which is unusual for most movies. So can you tell us about that? Well, you know, the premiere took place at, at the Vatican in a special uh, theater, law theater, which was very close. As a matter of fact, it's very close to where, where Pope Francis lives, mm -hmm. you know, St. Martha's uh, building. And... Um, so this 
particular place, uh, which was used to be a chapel, but during World War One, it was converted into a, a hospital for the wounded. You know, there were so many who were wounded at, at, at the time, and so now uh, John Paul used to love to watch videos and movies as well because you know he loved Christian art and he wanted to have Christian art influence. He was an know. actor. Yes, yes, absolutely. So now we had that premiere there. And um, there were a lot of dignitaries who came. It was a spectacular place. Mm -hmm. You know, truly, to have a premiere start in Vatican, what else could you ask for? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Michael, we know that you have a background actually in radio, but you've also done some other movies, one of which is the one that excited me because I'm a Maximilian Kolbe uh, fan, and that is Two Crowns. But what was it that specifically brought you to do something about Divine Mercy? 17 years ago, my... Uh, sister encouraged me uh, to read uh, the uh, diary of St. Faustina, of, of, yeah. of San Faustina, this book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, it was it was a uh, beginning. Uh, in the end, uh, I listened it, it uh, in the cassette tapes in my car. Mm -hmm. okay. But uh, it was amazing because uh, uh, under the influence of this text, in a way, uh, incomprehensible, uh, my life had changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, there is nothing extraordinary uh, about it because the diary has, has already uh, touched and changed the lives uh, of hundred thousand millions, millions, millions people in all continents. Uh, among the other things, uh, that's why I, de I decided to create uh, a movie that will be contained. Um, the, the, the essence uh, of the di uh, diary. Today, few people uh, read uh, books, but uh, many are keen uh, on watching movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that's that's why I I, I, I I think that love and mercy can do a lot a lot of good. Absolutely. Well, can you tell us a little bit about the movie itself? We know the love of love and mercy uh, was filmed in both Polish and English. So actually, we have. Uh, we, it, we don't need a dubbing, you know, as a matter of fact, because the actress played both roles in and both all languages. And all the actors and actresses spoke both yes, Polish yes, and they do. Uh, English, yes, right? Yes, they do. Yeah. And, and that's, why, that's why I think it's very authentic, yeah. you know. You, you, don't have a, you don't have somebody else kind of trying to replicate it. But uh, it, it, it's, it's a docudrama. So it shows both the uh, historical portrayal of the events of the life of St. Faustina mm -hmm but also it contains interviews with people and 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 there are many people who give witness to both the message and how it affected their lives how it changed their lives mm -hmm. you know because divine mercy is it's not just you hear something but it comes into your heart and 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 changes you within mm -hmm. and there's so many wonderful people both scholars as well and and witnesses okay. you know how how they how it affected their life yeah and you yeah we included uh, some sense for uh, uh, her life, Sister Faustina's life, uh, such as her uh, uh, call from Jesus uh, to enter the convent, um, um, her relationships mm -hmm. with uh, Father uh, Sopochko, the priest sent by the Lord uh, to help carry uh, out or, uh, her missions. Um, the frustra frustra frustrating process also uh, sh she went uh, through to create the Divine Mercy image. Uh, as Jesus requested, uh, there is a little uh, uh, humoristic uh, parts yeah. because uh, because it it had to be. She went to uh, the painter studio twice a week uh, mm -hmm. uh, for six months. Mm. So uh, he he gave him uh, directions mm. yeah. how, how the face had, had sure. to look like. So we, 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 the movie we talk about. Uh, uh, also, the re renovation of uh, the, the uh, image. image of uh, Jesus, uh, and uh, uh, at the moment we know that uh, the face of Jesus was corrected by Sister Faustina about uh, 20 times. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. But then they got a Miriam priest involved, right, bringing it to the United States. Um, Father Joseph Jarzembowski. Yes, yeah. Father Joseph Jarzembowski also uh, has a very imp important uh, role because mm -hmm. uh, he brings uh, the uh, cult uh, of divine mercy to America mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, full fight he, he, his promise to, to, pr to promote divine mercy mm -hmm. until the, the end of his life. Yeah. 
uh, in the field uh, uh, we, we we can uh, we will show previously unknown facts and documents yeah. yep and Father Kaz, we've involved other scholars and experts in this, this production as well. Oh yes, well you know, um, you know, but there were theologians, the scholars, scientists. So, so we have quite a few people there. But among others, we also have Father Seraphim, yes, Mikalenko, our expert, the, uh, our expert <laughs> here from the shrine, and and also we have uh, you know interviews from people from Lithuania. Uh, and uh, you know, obviously here in the states mm -hmm. as well. You know, there's also sister uh, from the uh, our sister's uh, Mother of Mercy community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, Sister Teresa de la Fuente. Yes, the mm -hmm. Sister Teresa yeah. de la Fuente, and yeah. and she does beautiful job yeah. of, of kind of bringing the message out. Nice. Yeah, and Michael, you mentioned about the face. Uh, doesn't that match the shroud? I mean, we all teach how there's a matching with the shroud of Turin, correct? Yeah, yeah, we are, we we. Are, we um, uh, we are excited uh, uh, because the film uh, breaks a new ground uh, with discoveries of original writings uh, from her uh, conf um, um, confessor, Father, Father, Father Sopochko, now blessed, uh, uh, Father, uh, uh, blessed mm -hmm. Michael Sopochko. Sure. Now, I was, uh, I was in, in touch by, because I, I had a part to play in it, a small voiceover that I was able to do, and it was filmed in many different places. So where would some of the filming take place? Well, you know, the, uh, the original intent was to have it in more places than we actually had it, but primarily it's Poland, Italy, and, and, and the United States. The other things we, uh, you know, it's not, it wasn't filmed, but we included materials from other places, mm -hmm. you know, because of, of the spread of the Divine Mercy, especially through, yeah. uh, you know, Wacom, which is the World Apostolic Congress uh, on Mercy. So we have, we have included some things there, but we actually did not have, uh, you know, everywhere. actually the crew there. But we did yeah. some filming here too, Father. Oh, yes, oh, yes, absolutely. Divine Mercy, so absolutely. we were able to get into it. So I'd like to ask, Father, what kind of reception comments have you guys been getting about this so far? In Poland, uh, <laughs> we, we, we have a theatrical release in Poland at the moment, published version of this movie, and uh, uh, it is uh, in uh, 250 uh, movie theaters, uh, movie yeah. theaters uh, and we have very good feedback. Uh, mm -hmm. Most the uh, 200,000 uh, wow. people wow. Seen it. saw this movie, wow. and, and thus uh, far, thus far, you know. yeah, yeah, thus far, uh, and it continues to enjoy interest. So we think that it will be double result. Excellent, but, excellent. But but not numbers alone yeah. are impo important right. because right. Uh, because uh, I received uh, testimonies. Every day from wow. from non, not believers. Wow, that's powerful. Who who, who uh, well we're uh, we're running out of time. I wish we could spend more, but I know that it's going to be shown on 800 theaters in the United States later this year on September 13th, as we said. So it's going to be shown in Europe, Asia, and the Americas. Yeah, and thank you both for being our guests. And I feel it's very important that uh, we get this movie out there. So you know what we're going to do? Let's take a short clip and uh, show our audience a little bit about this film. You won't go to any convent. I won't allow it! Why have you chosen us? I asked the Lord and he led me here. I will grant you a visible help. He will help you carry out my will. Jesus told me that you will be my confessor. Who told you? Jesus. Write all these words in your diary. This words you are certain Jesus told you himself. And sisters' visions. I want you to paint an image according to how you just saw me. This is amazing. And it's surprising that he chose her. What have you done to him? Paint it yourself. Can I take it to America? Of course. You have to run away. Then Gavudek has issued the warrant. Please open, sir. We are closed. No, 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 no but, but it's really urgent. Most of the things she said have already come to pass. You cannot doubt, even if I'm not here anymore. The results of anthropometric facial measurements of the key points of the face from the shroud and the painting by Eugeniusz Kazimierowski show a perfect convergence between the image of Jesus from the Shroud of Turin and the image that was created with the participation of Saint Sister Faustina. Powtarzam dzisiaj te proste i szczere słowa 
Siostry Faustyny, uwielbić niepojętą i niezgłębioną tajemnicę Bożego Miłosierdzia. I can't do it without you. I'll be supporting you to the very end. Wow, that was absolutely a powerful trailer. I think everybody would agree. And know that we will keep you informed on our websites of the release time and date of that great movie. You know, uh, as you heard Michael Kondrat say, that he was inspired by The Diary of St. Faustina, which is published by Marian Press. So joining us now, our next guest is my Marian brother priest, Father Don Calloway, renowned Mariologist and author, and whose latest book, The Ten Wonders of the Rosary, is uh, going to be coming soon. And joining him also is Jason Lewis is one of our new colleagues that's uh, working with me on my first book, also about suicide and divine mercy. So, guys, welcome to the program. Thanks, Thanks so much. Father. Good to be here. Father Don, why did you decide to write Ten Wonders of the Rosary? Yeah, well, a couple years ago, um, I wrote a big book on the rosary called Champions of the Rosary. And it's a great book, but it's over 400 pages. So uh, people love it, but they said, Father, that's a big book. you got to write something that a little smaller. That took me three plane rides to get that <laughs> book done. <laughs> wow, long plane rides, I guess. Um, so I thought, well, that's a great challenge. Maybe I will try something smaller. So I, I thought of that, and, but I thought how to do it. Well, growing up, I loved things like the seven ancient wonders of the world or ten wonders of Montana, those kind of things. Yeah. And I thought, that'd be neat to do. And, and so I thought, how many? Well, actually, there seemed to be ten great wonders of the rosary. So that's how I did it. Well, wow. Yeah. Now, you were also talking about specifically within that ten, which one drew maybe the most attention or maybe interest from you of the ten? Yeah, that's hard because they're all amazing. But I would have to say the tenth one, that's um, that the rosary is an indulgence to prayer. You know, we've kind of forgotten that today. And, um, you know, as Marians, part of our charism is to pray for the souls in purgatory and gain indulgences for them. And so when I discovered the power of the rosary and how it's indulgenced, and I discovered this, this is amazing. Every day on this planet, 150,000 people die. If you add that up every year, that's 55 million people. It's, sorry, I don't mean to make life of it, but that's bigger than any football stadium. Uh, exactly. Bigger than Michigan's football stadium. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, so we can gain indulgence. Yeah. Imagine if everybody's intention for the rosary was to help us all in purgatory. We'd make a big dent in wow. purgatory, you know? Absolutely. Wow. Wow. Now, how has the book been received? Uh, people are loving it. Yeah, they're telling me that once they start it, because it's a smaller book, they can finish it in a, two days, you know? Um, and a lot of people have asked me, they said, Father, how in the world did you get at, um, Bishop Athanasius Schneider to write the forward. And I, I said, yeah, I, I, he's a great guy. I didn't think he'd do it. But um, I sent him the manuscript in an email, and then he emailed me back himself. And he said that his own father was in a gulag in the former Soviet Union, oh. and that the, he used the rosary to find strength in that difficult time. And he said he would write the forward. Um, so I was, wow. That's you know? great. You know, um, I read a book years ago, uh, Father, Father Walter Chizik. Uh, he leadeth me. And I think he also prayed quite a bit of the, in the Russian work camps. Uh, he did. You're having a little yep. troubles with your mic. And, so. Uh, so anyway, Father Don, what is the one thing that you hope people will walk away from uh, after reading the book? Yeah, I guess I would say um, just a newfound love for the rosary. Because a lot of people, they've been praying it for a long time. But um, sometimes they get kind of uh, routine with it. And they, you know, maybe lose the enthusiasm, put it down for long periods. Some people have told me they've really, it sparked a new fire in them and wanting to pray it. And, Should I um, take my headset off? That's, I mean, that's, that's, I think, what the goal is. And to get people to know the power of it and the power of conversion and to come to God's mercy. And, you know, Father Don, I, I'm sorry to interject, but isn't that what Our Lady does? I mean, that's what's so exciting about what Our Lady does. She's appeared in how many countless places in the last couple centuries? And she's a mother, and she comes and brings heaven to us yeah. as a mother and brings the good news of her son and the gospel message. That's that's exactly what she does. And I think that, um, you know, I, I lead a lot of pilgrimages, and I go to places like Knock, Lourdes, Guadalupe, Fatima. And what are they all praying there? the rosary. Mm -hmm. And they're praying for conversions for themselves, for family members, that people would encounter conversion and experience God's mercy. You and know? you know, Father, that's really what the world needs. It needs something beyond what our headlines are, what the news reports are. Our, our world needs this message of divine mercy and is really thirsting for it. And that's what our Lord Jesus gave to Faustina. I mean, if we just look at the image of divine mercy, it is the resurrected Christ who is still bearing the marks of his passion in his hands and in his side. And this message really is a healing bomb for the world. And it's one of the reasons why I'm just so excited that Father Chris has, has brought me here and I'm working with the Marians with this, this message of divine mercy because it's just so necessary. Yeah. And as you can see, that's the reason that we brought Jason is one of the reasons we brought you in is because this is work that the Marians are doing in these special projects that we needed your help on and especially focused on this message of divine mercy and we have many many more projects and one that's 
particularly important to me is this new book that we're coming out with, uh, After Suicide, There's Still Hope for Them and for You. And Jason's been a big help with that book, but I don't know if you knew what you were getting into when you got into this one. I, I must confess, Father, I didn't write up front, and uh, it, but, but it's been an amazing project. Father Chris first brought me here to work on certain projects with Divine Mercy. It's my passion. I was excited about it. it, it then, then he pulled me to the side and said, but you know, I have this one particular project that's kind of special and dear to my heart. I've been working on a book on suicide and hope for those who have lost their lives to suicide and hope for those in the aftermath. And I was like, man, that's a pretty heavy topic to deal with. But I started to pray on it and I, it just really came to me. This really is an ep epidemic facing our world, our country and, and our culture today. And th then I saw like, he's really onto something and this really can bring healing and there's a need that he is addressing here. So I was fully on board. I wanted to do Lord's will, wanted to help him out. And especially when he told me his own personal story about his grandmother, I was entirely moved to be a, a part of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm no different, unfortunately, than so many people that you run into in the walk of life of uh, who've lost loved ones and family members, friends, colleagues, co-workers to suicide. Uh, you know, my grandma, um, who took her life, was a shock, obviously. But um, what it really did after I became a priest was show me the need I felt God was calling me for to spread this ministry, to go out and to talk to the people, to say that there is hope. So I felt I really had to do something about it. And I know you and you go to missions, Father Don, you say the same thing. Oh, I do. And I, I just can't tell you how many times that I encounter that now. People come up to me and they say, Father, we just um, had a family member commit suicide or a co-worker. And you're right, it couldn't be a better time to, to bring this message to people of hope. Yeah. And it's not just in this country, but Ireland's having a plague, South America, it's yeah. all over the place. Yeah. yeah. Again, that's the message of this, the message of divine mercy and what Jesus gives to Faustina. He says that the greater the sinner, the greater the right to his divine mercy. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and uh, Jason, you pointed out too the, the reasons too for lack of God. And we worked on this in the book or, uh, for suicides, lack of God and, uh, you know, proliferation of the culture of death and demonic, demonic influences. So there's a lot of these things that are unfortunately happening, Father. But what I love about this book is that it offers hope to those who believe in the misconception that the soul of someone who has taken their own life by suicide will not be saved. Father Chris, why don't you tell people what is the church's actual teaching about the souls of those who've taken their lives? Well, you know, that's the thing. We have, um, in our book, we've addressed this in two parts. And the first part is hope for those who have been lost to suicide. And people say, well, what do you mean there's hope? And the answer is salvation. Um, you know, the, many people still believe that the church teaches that somebody who takes their own life has... Um, been damned to hell and this is not the case the church teaches that in many cases there is mitigating circumstances maybe a mental illness or a lack of free will and this can reduce the culpability uh, we pray we don't know but we pray and this is something that we need to do so what we do we intercede we have these masses said we have the chaplets praying for them and you know God's mercy is so beautiful and what struck me specifically, Father Joe, was the catechism's own line about those who've taken their own life. It says, in ways known to God alone, he right. can offer them opportunity for repentance. Amen. So we pray for that. Amen. Mm -hmm. Again, we turn back to the mercy of God and trust that, you know, even if those grains are as plenty as all, I, I think about that and hold a handful of sand. I've been to the beach. I love the beach. I love the ocean. <laughs> Father Don, you know a little bit about That's this. Right. <laughs> when you pick up a handful of sand and all the grains that just come through your hand in that moment, that just literally millions of grains of sand. We're talking about a whole entire beach, a whole entire ocean of mercy. Mm -hmm. If our sins were that plentiful, that God's mercy is that big, that it envelops all of those sins and they disappear. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We're reminded by Jesus' message to St. Faustina that when he forgives our sins and the fire of his merciful love, they no longer exist. And that's where we get to the second part of our book. And Jason, you've, that's where you came in and really did a lot with us there in the second part. As I explained, where there's hope for those left behind. Because not only do we want the hope for the salvation of those who have been lost, but how is it for the people left behind? You know, the many survivors tell us, I don't know how I can get out of bed the next day. How am I going to get through work the next day? And then we show them a little ways that we're going to be able to do this. And this part to me was so important. This is why we brought in a really well-known grief counselor named Jeannie Ewing. And she assisted me and, and, and Jason's been working with us on this part of the book. She's helped us to convey the understanding of grief. She authored a great book, From Grief to Grace. And she's really helped bring us to help explain to these people how to move forward and get 
getting through life after such a loss. She also looked at amazing stories and transformations of people like Sammy Wood, who was a guest last yep. year on this show. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and I've gotten to know Sammy. She's just an amazing woman interiorly, and she has mm -hmm. one heck of a story, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. But she's had a story that, that touched her and really affected her whole entire family and had an impact on her whole entire family. And the beauty that, that Jesus in his divine mercy is he comes to us in our darkest moments. Mm -hmm. He comes to us when things aren't pretty and they aren't ugly. He comes to us just as we are. Yeah. And he has a healing balm of mercy. And that's really what we need in our present day and in our present age. Well, it certainly seems like this work uh, will bring God's healing mercy, as we said. But that brings to mind another book that Father Don's working on now, Consecration to St. Joseph, the foster father of Jesus. This is my namesake, of course, Joseph, so I'm interested in this. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, Father Don? Yeah. Yeah, I am so excited about, about this because, um, you know, with what we're talking about, there's so much woundedness in the world and so much confusion as well. And, you know, today the, the family is under attack. People are confused about what marriage is. Men don't know what it means to be men. Women don't know what it means to be a woman. So um, we need uh, St. Joseph. I think now is the time of St. Joseph. He's the, the head of the Holy Family, our spiritual father, the terror of demons. And uh, he's got a lot to teach us. And so I've, I've written this book, uh, Consecration to St. Joseph. It's going to be a... Um, 33-day program of preparation and consecration that I think is going to bring about a lot of good. And next year, 2020, is the 150th anniversary of when uh, Pius IX made St. Joseph the patron of the Universal Church. You know, Father Don, I just happened to catch you on EWTN Live with Mitch Pacwa, and I just happened to be flipping through the channels and saw you there and, and listen. I think you're on to something here. This is really exciting, this consecration. I think we need that model of fatherhood that St. Joseph offers for us. We need his protection, yep. and I'm looking forward to, to seeing the book. You, you know when it's coming out? Yeah, so it's it's not going to be out until January 1st, 2020, so we've got about eight months left, but we need to get the permissions. that I, I got a lot of quotes in it from saints and popes and uh, art. I've commissioned artwork for it. So the title is Consecration to St. Joseph for the book, but I've, I've got a Facebook blog that I started that I post something every day to keep people interested because it's eight months away. So the blog is uh, Consecration to St. Joseph with Father Calloway. If people go to that on Facebook, they'll see daily postings to, to keep that enthusiasm going. We're just about out of time. So thanks, guys, for being with us today. We appreciate it. Thank you, Father. Thanks, it's good Father. to be here. Thank and you. we want you to take a look at now uh, something more about what Marian Press is working on uh, in the near future. Books have always been a primary channel through which Marian Fathers have shared devotion to Mary and the message of divine mercy. Our publishing arm, Marian Press, is a trusted source for publications on these topics. It all began with the diary of St. Maria Faustina Kowalska and has grown to include several books by both Father Donald Calloway and Father Michael Gately. Later this year, Father Joe Roche will also publish the third book in his series of beautiful coffee table books. France, a pilgrimage with Mary. In this book, with its breathtaking images, Father Joe will lead the reader on a Marian pilgrimage, exploring various Marian apparition sites in France. In January 2019, we released 52 Weeks with St. Faustina by EWTN TV host Donna Marie Cooper O'Boyle. In her thoughtful, personal style, Donna Marie follows the life of St. Faustina from birth to death, week by week, stopping to meditate on her spiritual insights into the unfathomable mercy of God. It's great to start at any time of the year. Marian Press is also addressing the critical issue of suicide and grief in the new book by Father Chris Alar. It will be published later this year. In an effort to bring an understanding of Jesus' love to younger readers, we have also started to publish illustrated children's books and books for teens and young adults. We're hoping in this way to bring the healing message of God's mercy to more souls earlier in their lives. Thanks to the positive response to our books around the world over the past few years, and by the grace of God, we've been blessed to increase our output all in the service of spreading the message of divine mercy and devotion to Our Lady throughout the whole world. With God's help, we plan to continue to provide books that live up to the motto of Marian Press your trustworthy resource for publications on Divine Mercy and Mary.
Father Chris, I'm sure you'll agree that uh, working on books is an exciting and dynamic process, and you've got a great staff there at the Marian Helper Center to help with that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, definitely, Father Joe, books are a great way to teach and to communicate. But the problem is, in our modern days, we are now starting to lose a little bit of that face-to-face -face communication. And we have lost, uh, in some sense, communication with our fellow pilgrims here on Earth. Well, you know, people today often practically don't even have to leave their houses. They can get things delivered to their houses, uh, products and food and groceries and, and, and everything. They can get the movie and TVs delivered right to their homes. And so that it's almost like you don't have a need to leave your own home. Yeah, and there's a tradition that says that we can get up and, and like I said, um, if we don't leave our own home, how are we gonna give you and spread the message? God commands us to spread this message of divine mercy. How are we gonna do that if we're not even leaving our own home? That's right, and one of the ways to make this pilgrimage, this, uh, this thing that the church teaches us about, is to come here to experience the healing power of God's mercy as these pilgrims who are here experiencing today, the healing grace of the God's mercy here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. That's right, Father Joe, and here to explain how we can experience the shrine in a new way are Gail and Michael Elias, Meisner Elias, and uh, we wanted to say welcome and thank you for coming on the show with us. Thank you. Hi, Father Chris. Thanks. Very good. You know, Gail um, and Michael before, in fact, Michael, I knew you back at uh, St. Mark's down in Huntersville, North Carolina. Right. So when I found out you were joining us up here at the Shrine of Divine Mercy working with the Miriam Missionaries, we're related. So welcome again, and it was great to have you guys. But anyway, we, you know, before we get to talking about the Shrine, uh, we were just discussing uh, how people in this daily world of uh, just busyness and everything never even have to even leave their homes. Everything's now on Amazon, and everything's ordered direct and whatnot. But you guys work with a group of young men and women, very specialized and getting out of the house. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, sure. They are called the Marian Missionaries of Divine Mercy. And it's a group of young men and women who spend at least a year serving the homeless and those in need here in the Northeast. Uh, they're answering Pope Francis' call to get out of our comfort zone, to help those who are out there on the margins goes on the streets, the and most forgotten. Absolutely, and that in itself is, is a way of experience what we're talking about, this, this healing power of mercy, isn't it? It is. Uh, in fact, I know that sometimes people will characterize the Marian missionaries as people who help the poor, but I know for a fact that the missionaries are going to reply, no, it's the poor who help us. Right. And they do that um, because serving those in need really brings us to an experience of divine mercy. It does that by what Mother Teresa of Calcutta characterized as, and I think I'm going to get this right, Jesus present in the distressing disguise of the poor. Mm -hmm. So experiencing those in need, the marginalized, the forgotten, is really an experience of Jesus. You know, absolutely. But he's also present in the stranger and the person whom we show hospitality. This is very important. And that's the kind of work that you specialize in, Gail, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, Father Chris, that's right. You might say that. I run the Federal House Inn, uh, on behalf of the Marian Missionaries of Divine Mercy, which is just a few minutes up the street. Mm -hmm. And while we run it like a business to support the Marian Missionaries, it is much more than that. It is a ministry, a ministry of hospitality where people can come and experience the love, care, and welcome of Christ. And they really do, because I understand now the Federal House Inn is the number one bed and breakfast in the Berkshires. Yes, it's a beautiful place. and. While there are many big resorts in the area, many people have told us that they want to come here to experience the peace and love. I tell them... Go ahead, Gail. Sorry. Yeah, I tell them it's because of the shrine up the road, the missionaries that are across the street. And, you know, everything that we do here, we, we really do pour our love into it. In fact, the people who come say they feel like they're on a retreat. They feel like they're... Their home, yeah, at home. And, and, and it really can be a kind of a retreat with the Marian missionaries just across the street. That's for sure. I, I would think you would agree that people probably feel that way, right, Gail? That's right. We offer the guests who stay at the inn um, that come to visit the shrine a pilgrim package where they get what every, like any guest would get. They would get a three course breakfast, wine, and hors d'oeuvres in the evening. But they get so much more than that as part of the pilgrim package. They get morning prayer, adoration, and mass across the street, evening prayer, and dinner with the missionaries. And they also get a tour of the shrine. And praying with and being around the missionaries really is like being on a retreat because the young people who spend time with the poor 
are really very inspiring. Absolutely, and I can attest to that. I've been over to dinner with Father Mike and all the missionaries, and it's just a time of joy. It's a time of peace. It's a time of love. It's a time of community. Um, you know, Father Mike runs their formation program, and it's really to see as a great experience. Yes, up, up to now. Every pilgrim that has been on a visit here has said that they want to come back. They want to come back soon, and they want to bring a friend. And Gail's not going to tell you this, but I will. She makes a fantastic breakfast, and I'm biased. Uh -huh. So if you don't believe me, go ahead online and read the review. I'll have reviews. to stop by for breakfast some morning. That sounds great. We would yeah. love that. Bring an appetite because yeah. it is a three-course breakfast. I've had it. It's good. Well, you've got it. Well, I should congratulate both of you and the Marian Missionaries of the Divine Mercy for a very creative and well-rounded medium for helping people to experience the healing power of Divine Mercy. I mean, you've got food, fellowship, prayer, and service. So how can people book a room? Well, they can go to uh, the website at federalhouseinn.com, or they can email us at info at federalhouseinn.com, or they can call us direct at 413 243 1874. I think that was 1824, right? 1824 or 1874? Well, I'm sorry, 1824. 1824, yeah. 1824. very yeah, good. 1824. Well, that's great. And, you know, I love that it all goes to support a good cause because you can't get more as Christ has told us to be able to help those who are helping others uh, as well as just not helping those directly, but helping those who are helping those directly. That's right. 100% of the proceeds go to support the Marian Missionaries of Divine Mercy. Mm -hmm. And how can our viewers ner learn more about the Marian Missionaries? So, yeah, if you're a young man or woman looking to to give at least a year of service to the poor and those in need in the area. Uh, you can contact the Marian Missionaries of Divine Mercy through the website marianmissionaries.org or by sending an email to info at marianmissionaries.org. Very good. You know, that's wonderful. And thank you so much, you guys, for joining us today. As thank I said, you. you two are a joy. I love your family. Your kids are great. And it's just a beautiful experience over there. And so some of our viewers, we hope to see them here at the Shrine on these pilgrimage packages that you were just told us about. But uh, speaking of the National Shrine of Divine Mercy, we would like to take a look at how these and those that, who make the pilgrimage are experienced through spiritual healing of divine mercy. It's so peaceful here. And that's the comment we hear most from visitors who come to the National Shrine of Divine Mercy here in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And it makes sense. Eden Hill, set among the beautiful Berkshire Hills, has been a place of healing and contemplation for almost 80 years. From this hill, we Marian Fathers have been spreading devotion to Mary Immaculate and the message of Divine Mercy as received through St. Faustina to all corners of the globe. We've translated St. Faustina's diary into English and spread devotion to the divine mercy around the world to those in most need of God's mercy. As Jesus said to St. Faustina, I am sending you with my mercy to the people of the whole world. I do not want to punish aching mankind, but I desire to heal it, pressing it to my merciful heart. Healing and holiness, that's what it's all about. That's what pilgrims seek when they come here, and that's what they often find. Many find inspiration as they contemplate the passion of Christ, walking our outdoor life-size stations of the cross. Many parents grieving the loss of a child find the place of comfort and solace at our shrine of the Holy Innocents. Families find consolation at the newly renovated Shrine of the Holy Family, and many find a place to pray before a replica of the original grotto where Our Lady appeared to St. Bernadette in Lourdes. Of course, many find strength and courage through gazing upon Christ in the image of divine mercy at our national shrine. Whatever your intention, whatever healing you seek, come to the national shrine of the divine mercy on Eden Hill. Here, you're sure to find a healing remedy for all the wounds afflicting your troubled heart. We know that not everyone who needs the healing of Divine Mercy can find the time to come to this National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and some don't have time to read. So that's why we Marians try to avail ourselves of every medium in order to reach all people in need with this healing message. 
You know, that's right, Father Joe, and that's why I'm so happy to introduce our next guest and good friend, Teresa Tamio, the host of popular radio program, Catholic Connection. Welcome to our program, it's Teresa. It's great to be here, Father. Thank you. You know, uh, Teresa, I'm sure many of our viewers know you from EWTN or from some of your great books, but I know you personally going back to the Detroit days. I grew up in the Detroit area with Channel 7, W. X, Y, Z. I That's still remember right. that. That's right. Yep. And, uh, and that was when I was growing up. In fact, my dad's a fan of yours. He oh, said great. He said, Teresa Tommy. Hi, Father Chris's dad. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you know, that Teresa Tommy, she was a trailblazer. She was one of the first lady anchors in our area. So God bless you. Yeah. So he remembers that. But anyway, for those of you who may not know or are familiar with you as much, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. Well, I spent uh, 20 years in the secular media in my hometown of Detroit, the Detroit area, uh, radio and television. And the last uh, 10 years were in TV, both at Channel 50 and Channel 7, and I had my reversion to the faith toward the end of that TV career and just really felt God calling me to do something different with my talents, and I left the secular media in 2000 and worked at a, uh, actually an evangelical station for two years, never left the church, came, officially came back to the church, but was working there as an evangelical, the same station where Al Crester worked. Oh, yeah. yeah. I know Al. Yes, and he's uh, on afternoons. So I was on his radio, radio. program. Yes, right. uh -huh. And uh, Al came back to the church and then started along with Tom Monahan and some other folks in the area. Former on the owner radio. of the Tigers. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And uh, Domino's, Domino's Pizza. pizza. Right. Domino's I always teased Tom Monahan and Irish been making pizza. How's that working? <laughs> Apparently pretty well. But, um, yeah, it was a great experience in secular media and allowed me to do what I'm doing now. And then Al brought me over to, and, and Tom brought me over to Ave Maria in 2002, and it's almost 17 years that I've been on the air there. And yeah, now it's, it, it's on, as you said, EWTN five days a week. Yeah, and if people yeah. haven't seen your work, I'm sorry to plug it, but it's great. Thank we, you. We absolutely love it. And, you know, I personally work with you on several projects. Right. We did the videos together about uh, my book on suicide and right. helping people and to Catholic cope. View for Women, yes. which was a very well-received. We did two episodes with you on yes. that, and which was phenomenal. Yeah, I still get people asking about that, so right. you guys did a great job. But anyway, we hope and work together with you more. And, uh, you know, yesterday we spoke at a packed house here. Yeah, over 400 people. We yeah. had a packed house, and uh, Teresa, you did a story, and uh, one of my good friends who, who came up and said, oh, yeah, Father, your talk was good, but Teresa's was excellent. <laughs> and... I slipped her a 20 to say that. <laughs> now, Teresa, I know you've done a lot with TV and books, etc., but now you're doing a very popular radio yes, program. Yes, every so day. So can you tell us a little bit about the differences uh, with radio uh, from TV? Well, I love all the mediums. I mean, and I, I write and do whatever I can with media. I write for a newspaper, our Sunday Visitor, and, and I do the radio show every day. I do TV for EW. WTN, which is such a blessing, Catholic View for Women in the March of Life. But radio is such a personal medium. And we have seen, and the research shows us, we now have over 300 brick and mortar stations in the United States, but over 500 stations worldwide, plus Sirius Satellite Channel 130 and uh, EWTN radio affiliates that can pick us up on other you know, channels. But radio is still so personal in terms of the research. We were talking yesterday in preparation for the show, all the, the Nielsen surveys, and, and when you look at the demographics and the audience breakdowns, even among the younger millennials, they're still listening to radio. They may listen differently. They may listen on their phone or on their laptop or whatever, but radio is still very personal. And so to have access to Catholic airways five days a week has been phenomenal. And the stories we get, the testimonies we get from people whose lives are changed. You know, and that's Catholic why we radio. had you on here because right. people think when we're, this show is about God's healing message of mercy through right. these channels. It's yes. about TV, through, um, you know, uh, movies, uh, through books, as we just heard. Right. But we didn't want to forget radio. And Radio's you just huge. you just gave us that reason. Yes. Radio's never going to go away because uh, people still drive. <laughs> you know, this wonderful conference that you put on yesterday, I had so many people come up to me and say, I feel like you're, one man came up and says, you're in my kitchen every day. I hear you every morning. And I said, yeah, and start that coffee a little bit earlier for me because you're not. But no, and that's how personal radio is. Right. And people say, I, I feel like you're my friend. That's the best right. compliment we can yeah. get yeah. because there is that personal connection because radio is still so, even though technically you have TV on your phone as well, there's just something about listening to that it voice. Is. And you know, in fact, but we can still use all of these to get right. Divine Mercy out there. So the question I want to ask you, Teresa, is this message for you. We know you love Divine Mercy and you've helped us, Marian Fathers, to spread it. But how did your devotion begin to this Divine Mercy? I just think from my own um, conversion and reversion back to the church, because as I said yesterday in my testimony, it's all about God's mercy. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the mercy of my husband who prayed me back into the church after he came back to the church as, a, as an on-fire Catholic. And it's God mer God's mercy and all the messes that I made of my life, but taking those negative experiences.
experiences and turning them into Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. So I get to say hi, Deacon, right? Yeah, your, say your hi, Deacon Don. Hi, hi, Deacon honey. Don. He's watching right now. At home. He just preached this morning, by the way, which is why he couldn't be here because uh, the diaconate called. That's excusable. But yes, but no, it's, it's, it's an amazing journey. And I said as I began my testimony yesterday, and every time I give my testimony, I know how I got here. I know I got on the plane from Metro Detroit, flew to Albany, was driven here by my friend Hope, who works for you now. But every time I do a talk, every time I'm on the radio, it really is the mercy of God that just sure. amazes me. But, you know, coming, you described to us your secular background. And, you know, Father Joe here, uh, he never says it, but I, I love this story. He actually was working with some Hollywood producers about maybe being on a soap opera wow. back in the day. But you know what he did instead? He decided to choose the priesthood. Praise God. Praise the God. The calling of God. Yes. Although I think the soap operas could use some blessings right yes. now, oh. some, some priestly scripts, intercession. The, the word yeah. of God is better to deliver than the scripts that you exactly. get from that. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. And so what happened was he ended up taking this route and you kind of did a similar thing my question for you is this um, the lure of that secular media and film and radio and all that how did you find the transition then coming over to this type of work rather than the draw of the secular type well it was a, it was I think there was a, a combination of things for me first of all at the end of my secular career I was pretty unhappy I didn't feel like I fit in anymore even though I had been doing radio since I was in high school the first time I was on the air was 14 years old at a high school radio station so I didn't know how to do anything else but news and reporting. Mm -hmm. And so there was that concern that what am I going to do? But at the same time, at the end of my secular career, I didn't feel like, again, I was contributing anything. I was covering car crashes and fires and murders. And, and I didn't feel that my journalistic skills were being used to help anyone as a journalist. And so I felt a desire to do something more. And I just didn't feel like I fit in because I started to recognize when I came back from the church, the bias, the sensationalism sure. that was always there, but I didn't see it before when I had my conversion back to the faith, my reversion, the eyes, just like St. Paul, my, the scales were removed from my eyes. And it was, it was tough. I think it was a little scary because what am I going to do now? But when you say yes to God, as I said earlier this morning, when I gave a little mini testimony, look out, God is in charge of the whole universe. He's got your back. He's got to figure it out already. Just mm -hmm. Jesus, I trust in you. That's what we need to say. Amen. Yeah. Well, Teresa, we want to thank you so much for, for coming thank today. You. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, and keep up doing the great work you're doing. Thanks, and we're going to promote it. I've already got great response on my Facebook page. I put some pictures great. up this morning. Yeah, so, yeah. We, you know, we every year we do this conference, and uh, we have great speakers. But I tell you, everybody was coming up to me after your talk, so uh, I'm very glad that you could make it. Well, I'll come back if you want and me we to. We'd love you, to have you back. We want you <laughs> to have right. you back. Well, Thanks we've spent so a good amount of time talking about the channels we use to spread the message of divine mercy. Due to time limits, we couldn't delve into every message medium we use, but the Marianas have several apostolates that also help to deliver this message. So let's take a look right now at this next video. The healthcare professionals at Divine Mercy literally put the message of healing through Divine Mercy into practice. Hello, my name is Marie Romagnano. I'm the founder of Healthcare Professionals for Divine Mercy. I'm very pleased to introduce our new video educational series, Healthcare Divine Mercy Matters, which launches today on Divine Mercy Sunday. It's available free on the website divinemercymatters.org. Over the past 15 years, we have offered annual academically accredited conferences that integrate medicine, Catholic bioethics, and spirituality of divine mercy and patient care. Our new web series, with the expert assistance of Dr. Brian Thatcher, founder of the Eucharistic Apostles of Divine Mercy, gathers some of the best talks and presentations over the years from distinguished leaders in their respective fields. Each week, we will post a new talk. We begin the series with the stunning testimony of Dr. George Delgado, the pioneer of abortion pill reversal, a man responsible for saving hundreds of babies of mothers who have changed their minds after taking the abortion pill RU486. Upcoming talks include Father Chris Alar speaking on divine mercy and suicide, Sister Marie Simon Pierre, the nun cured from Parkinson's disease after praying to Pope John Paul II, and the bioethicist Father Germain Kopaczynski, who brings wisdom to bear on the many thorny moral and ethical issues raised in healthcare. We decided to release these talks because the content is timely and critical in understanding serious health-related and ethical issues affecting everyone. When families today face crucial, often life-and-death situations and must make informed decisions for themselves and their loved ones, they can turn in confidence to the wisdom of the church, especially the healing nature of sacraments and the message of divine mercy. If you are a healthcare professional, 
This year's 15th annual Divine Mercy Medicine, Bioethics, and Spirituality Conference is May 7th and 8th at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. Our keynote speaker will be Dr. Gosha Brzezinska, a London-based nursing professor and the biographer of the first lay registered nurse ever to be beatified, Blessed Hannah. Her biography on Blessed Hannah will be released this May by Marion Press. Thank you, and may the Lord guide you and bless you and your families. You know, we heard in that video, Father Joe, the importance of what we are spreading this message of mercy. And we've been talking about TV, we've been talking about movies, we've been talking about radio, we've been talking about books, and even personal retreats. But I love that video because it talks about the web. How could we talk about channels without bringing up the internet? This Absolutely. internet is becoming, unfortunately, in some ways, fortunately in others, such a, a powerful medium. And as we just heard there, the web is one way to do it. So we want to show you some listings of some different areas that we can give you those web uh, access and resources to what we do with Divine Mercy. That's right. And social media doesn't seem to be going anywhere anytime soon. Everybody these days seems to be on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Yeah, and where people are communicating is where we got to be. And so people are like, I thought you guys were monks in monasteries. And, and then, yes, we do. We have that time of prayer. But we also have to communicate to the people in the way God gives us. And so this is very important. Wherever people are communicating the most, that's where we need to be. And right now, that's social media. Absolutely. And I know that we've been encouraging folks over the Internet to read Father Michael Gately's outstanding book, 33 Days to Merciful Love, in preparation for a consecration to divine mercy today. So far. Father Chris, would you please lead us in this prayer of consecration? Absolutely. But before I do, you know, I just wanted to say that there's an important date today, being Divine Mercy Sunday. This is a date that people who are consecrating or re-consecrating began on March 26th. And so whether or not it's your first time or you're doing it again, we would now like to have you join us to become part of this prayer and consecrating ourselves. You know, um, Divine Mercy and consecration to it is what today is all about. Amen. So please join us now in this prayer. Merciful Father, relying on the prayers and example of Abraham and Mary, my father and mother in faith, and of St. Therese, my sister in the way of humble confidence, I, Father Chris, choose this day with the help of your grace to strive with all my heart to follow the little way. And so I firmly intend to fight discouragement, do little things with great love, and be merciful to my neighbor in deed, word, and prayer. I aim to keep before my eyes my poverty, weakness, brokenness, and sin, trusting that my littleness and contrite heart will attract your merciful love. I choose to remain always little, not relying on my own merits, but solely on yours, dear Lord, and those of the Blessed Mother. Finally, I believe, my God, that you can and will make me into a saint, even if I have to struggle all my life against vice and sin, even if I have to wait until the very end. This blind hope in your mercy, O Lord, is my only treasure. And now, to confirm my resolve and to console you for such rejection of your mercy, I offer myself through the hands of Mary Immaculate as a victim of Holocaust to your merciful love, asking you to consume me incessantly, allowing the waves of infinite tenderness shut up within you to overflow into my soul, and that I may thus become a martyr of your love, O oh my God, and a gift of mercy to so many others. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you, Father Chris, and God bless all of you who made this act of entrustment. As you can tell by today's topics and the seeming chaos and confusion that pervade our world in the present age, the world needs the healing that comes from Christ's divine mercy. Yeah, and Father Joe, Jesus told, uh, Jesus told St. Faustina, mankind will not have peace until he turns with trust to God's mercy. And in order to do this, you got to get involved. And this is the thing that we've been promoting getting people involved in any which way your local parish on the web on you know through the videos that you watch uh, we've been doing this one way is that uh, has been being brought to my attention is this coast to coast consecration mm. and this actually begins today there's a huge group of people who are leading this around the country um, it begins today and ends up a consecration on may 31st which is uh, my ordination date oh. and a big feast of our lady to the visitation. Uh, visitation the visitation and uh, but another way and a very 
solid way that we want to tell you about is the Association of Marion Helpers. Uh, we are grateful for our Marion Helpers, and there are so many of you listening right now, and we pray for you every day. Once enrolled, this is the beautiful part. Members share in our spiritual benefits of all our prayers, our masses, our sacrifices, our good works, just as if they were a Marian priest of the Immaculate Conception. So if you're not already a member of the Association and of the Marian Helpers, please consider enrolling yourself or a loved one. And it's very easy easy to do. Please just go to thedivinemercy.org slash EWTN or call 800-462-7426. That's 800-4-MARION. And enroll today and we'll send you this beautiful family blessing that you see as a card, as a free gift to you. Look on the screen how beautiful that is. The association has been going for about 75 years. It's our 75th anniversary, wow. and uh, I have the pleasure and the honor to be the director there. And I tell you, God's given me the gift of all gifts to be able to do this. That's tremendous. Yeah. Well, we had a great show today, Father Chris. Uh, what would you want our viewers to take away from this show today? Well, Father Joe, I think mainly, is, as we said, these channels that we're going to be using to spread divine mercy um, is have the people get involved. Uh, you can do this. You can get involved. And if you can't, join us through the association, and we become the hands and the feet. You know, your prayers support us. Uh, our prayers support you. This is the beauty of it. And so this is this whole message of God's healing mercy that we heard about today. And I would like our viewers to remember that we are call, all called to receive God's mercy, but in turn to give it. And for me, there's no better way than becoming a member of the Association of Marian Helpers. You know, you can be a part of our family and to join us in using these channels, radio, mm -hmm. television, mm -hmm. movies, books, retreats to spread this message of God's mercy. You know, Father Joe, at the end of every Mass, the Latin is ite misse est, which mm -hmm. you hear in English, go, you're being sent. People forget that. They think Mass ends on Sunday, I'm done. No, we're not. We're to be sent and to go out to spread the message of the gospel. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. And if you can't physically do it, join with us, Marian Helpers. We're doing it. And with your help uniting to us, we're one big family doing this for God. That's true. And that, that message of healing, it's so important because our world, as we said, is, is so confused and so broken and so hurt that we really need the healing. I was uh, taking a look in Rome this morning, uh, the Holy Father, at the Regina Celi message, the uh, Angel of the Lord message at um, noon, which during Easter, instead of the Angelus, they do the Regina Celi. He talked about the wounds of Christ. He said to Thomas, put your hand in my wound, touch the wounds of Christ. And he said, this is very important, to touch the wounds of Christ, because these wounds represent this hurting world. This wo the, his wounds represent our wounds, and by touching the wounds of Christ, we're touching and asking for healing. You know, Father, it's amazing you just said that. This is the honest truth. I couldn't lie to a priest. Today's a day that we want to go to confession. Of course, you can have gone to confession before to receive this beautiful grace of Divine Mercy Sunday. But I just went to confession, and the priest gave me as a penance the five wounds wow. to pray the blood and water prayer of There's, the five wounds of Christ. Praise God. We, we hear the, uh, the bells are ringing, so that means the procession uh, is about to start. We're getting ready for the holy sacrifice of the Mass today, which will be celebrated at our field altar by uh, Edward Scharfenberger, who is the uh, Bishop of Albany, New York, which is the neighboring diocese just across the New York border from us. Uh, we're here in Massachusetts, and uh, the Bishop is over in, um, um, he's a good friend of the Marians. Yes, and in fact, I, I love Bishop Scharfenberger. He is a beautiful, he's very much active in the pro-life movement, uh, and he's been a huge supporter of Divine Mercy and consecration. 33 days in his diocese. That's right. I think he had uh, the whole diocese uh, uh, consecrating yes. uh, themselves with uh, Michael's book, and uh, he said it was like a, a bomb of grace uh, in, in the diocese.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. peace be with you. My brothers and sisters, Jesus is always knocking on the door of our hearts, very gently. Sometimes we play hard to get. Let's make it a little easier for him and acknowledge our sins and our need for his love and mercy, asking forgiveness for ourselves and for all of us. You have come to bring us life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You have given us your life that we may live. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You have sent us into the world you love to tell the good news. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Et in terra pars hominibus, ore voluntatis, paramus te, benedicimus te, panoramus te, glorificamus te, Let us pray. God of everlasting mercy, who in the very recurrence of the Paschal Feast kindled the faith of the people you have made your own, 
Increase, we pray, the grace you have bestowed, that all may grasp and rightly understand in what font they have been washed, by whose spirit they have been reborn, by whose blood they have been redeemed. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Many signs and wonders were done among the people at the hands of the apostles. They were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the others dared to join them, but the people esteemed them. Yet, more than ever, believers in the Lord, great numbers of men and women were added to them. Thus, they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on one or another of them. A large number of people from the towns in the vicinity of Jerusalem also gathered, bringing the sick and those disturbed by unclean spirits, and they were all cured. The word of the Lord. Lectura del libro del Apocalipsis del apóstol San Juan. Yo, Juan, hermano y compañero de ustedes en la tribulación, I, John, en el brother, reino who share with you the distress, the kingdom, and the endurance we have in Jesus, found myself on the island called Patmos because I proclaimed God's word and gave testimony to Jesus. 
I was caught up in spirit on the Lord's day and heard him behind me a voice as loud as a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. And when I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands and in the middle of the lampstands, one like a son of man, wearing an ankle-length robe with a gold sash around his chest. When I caught sight of him, I fell down at his feet, as though dead. He touched me with his right hand and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the one who lives. Once I was dead, but now I am alive forever and ever. I hold the keys to death and the netherworld. Write down, therefore, what you have seen and what is happening and what will happen afterwards. Como sobre las que sucederán después. Palabra de Dios. to John. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. Be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Thomas called Didymus 
one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger into the nail marks, and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. Now a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and bring your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. A la noche del día de resurrección, estando cerrados las puertas de la casa donde se hallaban los discípulos por miedo a los judíos, se presentó Jesús en medio de ellos y les dijo, La paz esté con ustedes. Dicho esto, les mostró las manos y el costado. Cuando los discípulos vieron al Señor, se llenaron de alegría. De nuevo les dijo Jesús, La paz esté con ustedes. Como el Padre me ha enviado, así también los envío yo. Después de decir esto, soplo sobre ellos y les dijo, Reciben al Espíritu Santo. A los que les perdonan los pecados, les quedarán perdonados, y a, y a los que no se los perdonen, les quedarán sin perdonar. Tomás, uno de los doce, a quien llamaban el gemelo, no estaba con ellos cuando vino Jesús. Y los otros discípulos le dicen, Hemos visto al Señor. Pero él les contestó, Si no veo en sus manos la señal de los clavos, y si no meto mi dedo en los aguijeros de los clavos, y no meto mi mano en su costado, no creeré. Ocho días después, estaban reunidos los discípulos a puerta cerrada y Tomás estaba con ellos. Jesús se presentó de nuevo en medio de ellos y les dijo, La paz esté con ustedes. Luego le dijo a Tomás, Aquí están mis manos, acerca tu dedo. Trae acá tu mano, métela en mi costado, y no sigas dudando, sino cree. Tomás le respondió, Señor mío y Dios mío. Jesús añadió, Tú crees porque me has visto. Dichosos lo que creen sin haber visto. Otras muchachas señales milagrosas hizo Je Jesús en presencia de sus discípulos, pero no están escritas en este libro. Si escribieron estas para que ustedes creen que Jesús en el Mesías, el Hijo de Dios, y para que creyendo tengan vida en su nombre. The Gospel of the Lord.
Let me just begin by saying to each and every one of you, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the sacrifice you made in order to be here. Thank you for putting up with the rain, although the rain has its own symbolism. We know a lot of times when people have rain on their wedding day, although they don't like it, it's said to be a sign of God's blessing. So, and I'm lucky standing here in a beautiful big umbrella, but thank you very much. And of course, thank you is a totally appropriate thing for us to do, uh, particularly on a Sunday particularly on a Sunday that we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because remember that it's still Easter. This wonderful tradition we have of the octave of Easter in which every single day, all the eight days beginning on Easter Sunday, right through Divine Mercy Sunday, are part of the same liturgical day. Today is Easter, and we're celebrating with Thanksgiving the sacrifice, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And of course, we know that Mass in Greek, all of you who know your Greek, you know, what is the Greek word for Mass? It is Eucharist, Eucharistia, and it's from the verb to give thanks. This is what we do. It's the most appropriate action of love that we can give. Every human being likes to be thanked. Isn't it true? Every human being. And God is no exception because God's a real person, and God loves to give, and God loves that we receive those gifts and that we appreciate them with gratitude. So today, I would like to see as a day of gratitude to give thanks to the Lord for his blessing, for touching our hearts. Has he touched your heart? I hope so, because I have to tell you something. Uh, I want to tell you something else too. Because even if, even if there are still some things in your heart that are unsettled, that are not at peace, that aren't right, even if there's some memories there, even if there are something that troubles you now, maybe in a relationship, maybe something that happened in the past, maybe in a bad memory, I want you to know that it's no obstacle for the Lord to get in there. You see, this is also a feast of the heart. We're in the presence of the heart of the Curie of ours, of St. John Vianney who had the wonderful heart of a priest who was constantly surrounded by sin. Constantly, most of his life, he was surrounded by oppression, by sin, and by all sorts of griefs and anxieties. People came to him in droves, just loaded down with all their fears and anxieties and confusions and feelings of being somehow separate from God and from the people that they loved. And they came to him and they piled all of that on him on his little heart because God had given him the wonderful commission, power as a priest to absolve sins that we heard Jesus give his apostles today and their successors. He was able to say, I absolve you from your sin. But here's the point. They felt drawn to the Lord through this wonderful sacrament of peace, even though they were still aware that they may have been loaded down by sin. And that's the beauty of divine mercy, is that God doesn't wait until we're ready to come to God. God comes to us while we're still in our sins, while we're still struggling, while we still find it difficult at times to believe. I think we can all identify with Thomas to some extent. We don't know why he wasn't there. Why wasn't he there the first time when Jesus appeared in the upper room? Oh, maybe he had something better to do. Maybe he had some shopping to be done. I don't know. Maybe he was having some trouble with these crazy people that were saying that we saw the risen Lord, didn't believe them for some reason. Maybe he just couldn't deal with it yet. Or just maybe he was feeling guilt because he was one of those that wasn't there at the end when Jesus died, like all of the others pretty much so, except for John and, and Mary. Maybe he just felt this was over now. Maybe he trusted his own instincts too much. You know, this is the way life ends. Life ends in death. When it's over, it's over. You know, in, in the long run, it's death and not life that has the final say. The world is a rotten place. It's not going to be getting any better. We know the way it works. That's the real world. That's reality. And all he saw when Jesus died on the cross, or when he heard he died on the cross from the others, and not that he believed, Jesus was really dead, 
That fit in with his vision of reality. I'm just speculating, you know. Maybe, maybe that is one of the things that at times fits in with our vision of reality. And the surprise suddenly of hearing that Jesus is risen, he couldn't cope with that just yet. So we can understand it. But you have to give him a little credit too because he did come back. And he had the courage, I say God-given, to say, I want to see Jesus. I want to see the wounds in his side. I want to believe. Oh Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. It's a reminder to us that even in our doubts, even in our anxieties, even in our oppression, even in our fear, that's the one time we most need to turn to the Lord. Isn't it funny that sometimes when we've sinned, when we've got into a habit of sin, when we become depressed, when we feel nobody loves us anymore, when, let me just stop right there. When I feel nobody loves me anymore. I'm going to tell you something I learned from a nun, or at least heard from a nun. I didn't learn it, but I heard it when I was in grammar school. I remember her saying around the Easter season, remember, Jesus loves you enough that if you were the only person in the world, he would have died for you. Do you believe that? Jesus would have died for you if you were the only person in the world. And that means everybody sitting in the last rows over there too. That means all of us, all of us, even priests. He loves us too. And, and my special love to my brother priests who are here too because we are in the presence with, as you know, the one who is the patron of all parish priests, the curie of ours, because his priestly heart never tired, never tired of hearing the sins and the struggles of the people that came to him because he knew Jesus had put him there for that purpose. And even though that burden must have been great, 16, 18 hours in the confessional, he never lost sight of that because he knew that Jesus loved him and had chosen him for this task. I remember I had an experience like that in my own personal life, not quite like this, but I had the benefit of a very good Catholic education. I had wonderful sisters in school, the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur. And I remember, I remember that uh, I had learned my catechism pretty well, but I wasn't evangelized. I believed somehow that being a Catholic meant you have to try real hard to be good. And if you were good, God would be nice to you. And if you were bad, God would be ticked means God would be angry, and he would move away in some way. You know, have you felt that way sometimes? Have you felt guilty sometimes? And maybe God, maybe I'm not being good enough. But see, part of the problem was the way I was, and I have to say it this way, the way I was dealing with God. I wasn't trusting God to be God. What I was doing was I was saying, Lord, help me to be a little bit better, realizing that I needed a lot of improvement in my life. And so I said, you know what, instead of just giving you 50%, maybe I'll give you 60%. I'll do it 60% your way and maybe 40% my way. Let's, come on, let's just negotiate this a little bit. Let's be pals. And little by little, I was, okay, maybe during Lent, you, you feel a little bit holier. I said, okay, maybe I'm going to give 80% during Lent, you know. But I want to hold on to 20% of my stuff, you know. Let me deal with it my own way. And... What I came to realize is I was not treating God like God. I was not treating Jesus like Jesus. I was treating him just like a pal, you know, like an equal. So maybe we can just get along together, you know? Can't we all just get along, you know? And no wonder it's so difficult for the Lord to get through because it's that 20% that's all about me and all about my deals that really needs to be healed. That's the door that needs to be broken down. That's the door of mercy that the Lord wants to pierce through so he can remove that part of myself that still holds back, that still wants to hold on to my own sins, my own attitudes, my own prejudices, my own habits, my own past, my own definition of who I am, and not to see myself in the light of God's love. And I remember sitting at a kitchen table one time with a priest friend of mine, a young priest friend of mine who had his own struggles in his life. And I remember it was a particularly difficult time in my life. I think I was in my mid-30s, and I was studying in postgraduate school, and I was wondering, why am I doing this? You know, uh, why, why, what is God asking? And I kind of expected a lecture from him because I was complaining, you know, like Thomas was complaining. Something wrong. My faith isn't completely what it should be. I, I, and I knew that. 
And uh, I remember him looking at me with a smile and saying, well, don't you know that God loves you? Now, I had heard that before, but I, did I really believe that in my heart? Because here's the thing. We can know things about Jesus. We can know things about divine mercy. And we could tell people how wonderful it is. We can tell people how to pray the chaplet. We can have a beautiful picture of the divine mercy in our home. And we could even go through many, many sacrifices in our lives. But unless you or I believe that that divine mercy is for me personally. See, this is what evangelization is all about. You know, it's a big word, and a lot of times it sounds like. It doesn't mean beating people over the head with the Bible. It doesn't mean reading the Ten Commandments to them. Everybody knows them anyway. They're in our hearts. We basically know what's right and wrong. The problem is we don't always do it. And the reason we don't is because we don't trust the only one that can help us to do that. We think we're all on our own, and then we feel lonely, and nobody loves us, and nobody cares. And we bring this on ourselves. We take this burden, and Jesus is saying, you know, let me into your heart. Let me get in there and relieve those doubts. Let me give you the mercy. See, maybe one of the reasons Thomas found it difficult to believe the word of the apostles and the first disciples was because they themselves may not have been evangelized. And it wasn't until Jesus said to them in the upper room, your sins are forgiven, and whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. You know, imagine the position they might have felt themselves in after having really abandoned their Lord and Savior. Wouldn't they have expected that he would come back pretty angry, pretty ticked? pretty upset, and that's not, but that's not the way Jesus approaches sinners. He doesn't approach us with a scowl, but with a welcoming smile, like he did with the woman at the well, like the prodigal son approaching his father, looking for him to come back, embraces him when he comes. So the Lord embraces us. Maybe they had not yet been evangelized to believe that Jesus loved them personally and forgave them. And that's why they needed divine mercy. That's why we need divine mercy. It's one thing to believe and to profess that Jesus suffered, died, and rose for the whole world. It's another thing to believe that Jesus suffered and died and rose for you and me so that each and every one of us has a future with him in heaven and with one another redeemed. And that's why divine mercy is the capstone. Pope Francis uh, has often spoken about the divine mercy. He speaks of it as the beating heart of the gospel. And what's the gospel? What does gospel mean? You know, you learned it in school, you, you preach it perhaps. Gospel means good news. Well, what's the good news? The good news, yes, it's that Jesus is the savior of the world, the savior of us all, that he's everyone's savior, we know that. But the good news is even more importantly, that he saves each and every one of us one by one, you and me personally. And when that gospel hits my heart, then and only then can I become an evangelizer, a person who is on fire with that love. And that's the love that Jesus wants us all to have today so that we truly can go into the world and tell the good news. Because it's not just the good news that somebody else received, but it's the good news that I received in my heart, and my heart is full of joy. Now, if, if you're not feeling that right now, don't get upset, relax. It's not just a feeling. It's not just about warm fuzzies. It's not just about being able to say, you know, uh, I see Jesus in my orange juice glass and wherever I go and things like that. No, it's not. It's, sometimes people characterize, you know, car caricature, they make mockery of people, the come to Jesus moment you hear about. It, it's not just about that. It's not just about shouting and screaming that. It's about really trusting and believing that, that we have this incredible loving God that wants to enter our hearts and wants to stay there so that we truly become tabernacles of the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that mean? Me, a tabernacle of the Holy Spirit? That's another old-fashioned saying that I remember the sisters telling us, that all of us are meant to be tabernacles of the Holy Spirit. But I know I'm not worthy. 
And I know all of these sins that I don't even want to admit myself. And I know my past, and I know my problems, and I know my temptations and my proclivities and all of those kind of things. But still, see, that is, that is not an obstacle for the Lord. That's exactly why he came. In fact, as we hear in the scriptures, St. Paul tells us where, where sin is on the rise, where sin increases, grace abounds all the more, the loving grace of God. Jesus is attracted to sinners, not their sins, because he knows they're burdening them. But he goes out of his way to be with us, particularly when we're struggling the most. So if you're going through a dark period of your life, if you're worried about the world, worried about your family, worried about your health, worried about your parish, worried about your neighbor, whatever it is, whatever the source of fear and anxiety and grief, that's exactly where Jesus wants to be with you right now because he knows that you're struggling with that and he wants to be with you and that's why he's here and he wants you to know that. That's the message of divine mercy and not just today but every day of our lives. Lord Jesus, I trust in you. Lord Jesus, I trust in you. It's a wonderful thing to say, even if you wake up three or four o'clock in the morning and you're worried about the taxes and worried about everything else. Lord Jesus, I trust in you. Imagine him looking at you with love and let him into your heart. That's the message that Jesus has for each and every one of us today. And it's the message that we are going to celebrate in a special way in a few moments as I will bless you with the heart of blessed St. John Vianney, who had the wonderful heart of that priest and gave to us by his ministry an example of what in some way all of us can be as ministers of mercy to bring that light into the world that is sometimes so full of darkness. It can only come if you and I are personally convicted of the knowledge and belief that you and I are loved deeply. And I go right back to what I said at the very beginning that I learned when I was in grammar school, but I think it went in one ear and out the other, that Jesus loves each and every one of you and me personally enough to die for us, even if you or I were the only person in the world. We have here the heart of John Vianney with us and brought by the Knights of Columbus from the shrine of Saint John Vianney in Ars, France. The relic is the incorrupt heart of this saint. And as I mentioned, Saint John Vianney is the patron saint of priests. So I want in a special way, because he prayed for priests, that this blessing to touch the heart of all of our priests to know his special love for them, because we love them, don't we? And we need them to bring God's mercy to us. This is also a visible icon, an image of the heart of Jesus. St. John's heart is a model for priests, since St. John Vianney spent countless hours in the confessional, in Eucharistic adoration, and with people of all walks of life. He's the model priest for all priests. So let us invoke St. John Vianney's intercession in praying St. Faustina's prayer for priests. O oh my Jesus, I beg you on behalf of the whole church, grant it love and light, the light of your spirit, and give power to the words of priests so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to you, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. You yourself maintain them in holiness. O divine great high priest, may the power of your mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of your mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of a priest, for you can do all things. Amen. 
through the intercession of St. John Vianney, patron of priests, I bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. My brothers and sisters, with joy at Christ's rising from the dead, let us turn to the Father of mercies. He heard and answered the prayers of the Son he loved so much. Let us trust that he will hear our petitions. For our church, that she may reflect the mercy of the risen Lord to all the nations on earth, 
Let us pray to the Lord. For all the bishops and priests, that through the intercession of St. John Vianney, patron of priests, they may radiate holiness and purity in their lives, let us pray to the Lord. For all the politicians in the world, throughout the world that they may promote the dignity of each human being, especially the poor, the elderly, and the unborn, let us pray to the Lord. Against Christians and other religious communities throughout the world, that religious dialogue and respect for religious freedom may bring about a new culture of peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. That they would generously follow the Lord's call to follow Him in the priesthood religious life, and holy matrimony. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. For the sick and the dying, especially those most in need of thy divine mercy, that they will have a great trust in the inexhaustible fount of God's mercy. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And per and per perpetrators of clergy sexual abuse, that they will find truth, hope, and healing in the rays of divine mercy. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For immigrants throughout the world, that they might be granted a new home on earth while continuing their pilgrimage to heaven. Let us pray to the Lord. For all the members of the Association of Marian Help and the Confraternity of the Immaculate Conception both living and deceased, and for all the intentions they have entrusted to the congregation of Marians. May the Lord favorably hear their prayers and strengthen them in faith, hope, and love. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we have brought before you our needs and petitions, for we trust in your infinite mercy and goodness. We ask that you hear and answer our prayers according to your will. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. We are going to begin the collection. There are a number of ushers who will be coming to your section, so please watch for them. Uh, they're making an announcement about the collection now, so we'd like to talk about the um, banner, the Divine Mercy Prayer Banner for 2019, which is hanging near the altar. Each year we've offered our Marian helpers something special for Divine Mercy Sunday. Once again this year we've invited them to write their prayer intentions on cloth squares. More than 15,000 people responded, and their squares have been made into a beautiful banner that emphasizes the necessity of coming together to promote the Divine Mercy message. Yeah, Father Joe, each square of cloth you see here today in its beautiful scene, as you can see, there represents a prayer intention from one of our Marian helpers, and this is just part of the beauty of being a part of the association. Um, it is just a way for us to pray as one. We'll pray for those intentions, especially today and throughout the year. So if God puts it on your heart, 
heart, I encourage you to consider joining this association because prayers are so powerful and it's the best gift you can give. That way, maybe next year we can include your prayer intentions as well because this banner is a reminder to all for us to pray and put our trust in God's mercy. Yeah. Yeah, and it's such a tangible expression of the trust that the Marian Helpers put in God's mercy. And uh, you can see this in the crowd today, Joe, Father Joe. Oh, it's beautiful. Uh, we expect, I think they said 175,000, 175 buses, <laughs> 17,000 people here today, all from the East Coast and Canada. I was uh, taking a walk yesterday, so cars from Georgia and Florida and Ontario, Canada. There's different ethnic groups here today, Filipinos, Latinos, Haitians, Poles, among many others. It's truly multicultural. And, you know, Father, we were just talking about this this morning. You know, you got to wonder about God's love and mercy gazing down on the world today and really Stockbridge is an epicenter. Um, in, in the whole world right now, the epicenter of divine mercy is right here in Stockbridge. Should we now take a chance to listen a little bit to this beautiful That's right. play? I, I wanted to point out with us today, not only Bishop uh, Scharfenberger from um, uh, Albany, but we also have the uh, Archbishop Emeritus of uh, Kaunas here. Uh, Lithuania. Lithuania. Yep. Countess Lithuania. Leon Guinness Virbalas. Uh, he's got celebrating. And this is a beautiful Northeast Catholic College Polyphony Choir from Northeast College, Catholic College in Warner, New Hampshire. There's 60 people in the choir. They're truly spectacular. They make us feel like we're in heaven. So let's listen to them now. Sinking down, sinking down, sinking down. 
We had a beautiful homily today from Bishop Scharfenberger talking about how mercy is personal. God wants to talk to us, each of us personally and give us that message of mercy. You know, I, I loved it, Father, that he pointed out about the octave. And so few people know that this is still Easter. We are celebrating this is the eight days, as Augustine said, the compendium of the days of mercy. And as Father Seraphim says, it's the perfection of of mercy. Uh, this is a, a, a perfection of Easter, if you will. This is a beautiful way. This eight days octave is all celebrated as if Easter were one long eight day period. Hey, and I it love, is. I love that uh, gospel passage where it says Jesus on the last and greatest day of the feast. Yes. So the Lord is pulling out all the stops today and giving us all the Easter blessings that he wants, he can. Yeah. And some of the things that Father uh, or Bishop Scharfenberger pointed out are just so beautiful. And, you know, we, we are so lucky to have him near us at the shrine. He's been an advocate for pro-life. He is, um, he's even written to the governor expressing uh, the concerns over the state of New York and how beautiful that he's rallied so many from a diocese that uh, was in many circles considered to be apathetic to now being thriving. And one of the reasons was the consecration. He consecrated the whole diocese using 33 days to morning glory. So what a beautiful uh, resurgence that's happening in the diocese of Albany. Well, he's preaching the good news one thing that it touched me today when he said Jesus goes out of his way to be with us particularly when we're struggling the most and he wants us all to know that and he said that, that beautiful thing at the bottom of the divine mercy means Jesus I trust in you we all have to believe that yeah and so few people as uh, he also pointed out what do we do we tend to have a tendency to run and hide and he said no you want to do the opposite and uh, you know um, one of those lines that always struck me in the diary is that the greater the sinner the greater the right you have to my mercy it's not even looked upon as a privilege it's a right that's right how beautiful that's right and the Lord uh, is so full of mercy he says each of us is a tabernacle of the Holy Spirit we're loved deeply and we need to believe that
you know, Father Joe, at this point, I think it's important for us to mention to all those who are here at the shrine, as well as going to any mass today for this Divine Mercy Sunday, how to receive this grace. Our Lord Jesus Christ promised in number 699 of the diary to St. Faustina that the soul that who has been to confession, so if you are in a state of grace and you have been to confession, you don't have to go to confession just today. It could have been, you know, earlier in Lent or wherever, but as long as you're in a state of grace and you receive Holy Communion, you come back to your pew. You just simply kneel down and make a simple prayer in your own words, something to the effect of Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. You promised through St. Faustina that the soul who has been to confession, I have and the soul who receives Holy Communion, I just did, will receive the complete forgiveness of sin and all punishment. And we will. This is the gift given by God that we just need to have some rectification of the will to want to change and to do better. But as remember, Father Joe, saints are simply sinners who just keep on trying. Amen. Amen. And so we just have to trust and open our heart to that grace that God in his great mercy wants to pour out on us today. Um, you know, the, the rain can be frustrating for us, but he pours out his graces on us in many ways, as the bishop said. You know, and Father, one of the nice things that Father Roszitski mentioned, and he's one of the world's foremost uh, experts on divine mercy that I don't even really think about much myself, but I think it's transforming, is in his writings, he said, you know, we think of this day of divine mercy as being a day of cleansing, um, of forgiveness of sin and a wiping out of punishment, and this is all very true. But he says, you got to also think of this for even a stronger grace of what is going to be given to you in the positive. In other words, if you are struggling with drugs or with alcohol or, or gluttony or whatever it might be, this is the day that the graces of God are flooded upon you to avoid those pitfalls in the future. So not only does God clean your past, he gives you the tools of grace to help in the future. Mm, it's amen. beautiful. Amen. That's great. It's a preventative grace yes. for the future so exactly. that we can avoid the, the near occasions of sin. You know, Father Joy was giving a homily the other week, and sometimes you don't know what's going to come from your own mouth in a homily, but I said, you know, in our life we've missed trains, we've missed planes, we've missed automobiles, but do not miss this grace, this grace of divine mercy. I said, don't miss this boat. This is the Queen Mary. Yeah. And then I realized... Queen Mary, this is, she is, this is the vessel. She's leading us to her son and this extreme amount of God's mercy. That's right. In uh, the Miraculous Medal, Mary has those rays uh, that uh, people don't ask for. There's so many graces that we don't ask for. See, God is generous, wants to give it to us, it, we don't ask for it, it. That's exactly right. In fact, so, uh, in one apparition, she was asked um, why she was sad, and she says, because so many of these graces nobody is claiming. So please, if you are listening, and even if you've already been to Mass today, and you say, well, well, Father, I've already received communion and I missed my chance. No, you didn't. This is the day, all day today. Ask for this grace. Again, you've been to confession, you receive Holy Communion, and now you say, Lord, please give me this grace of forgiveness of sin and all punishment. And as we say, we will be given it. You just have to have that, that little rectification of the will that I want to change. And God's there. He's not there to punish us. He doesn't want to punish us. He's there to want to heal us. And later on during communion, we'll lead a, a spiritual communion communion prayer for the homebound who aren't able to receive communion. God in his great mercy can give the graces also to them. We see that they are getting ready to uh, have the procession of the gifts up to the altar for uh, the um, um, Eucharist, the liturgy of the Eucharist. In those, that tradition, Father, goes way back in the church. Uh, people used to bring centuries, in the first centuries of the church, gifts from their own home. And they would bring food, and they would bring vegetables, and the procession would come forward. And so we've kept that tradition in the church of people giving the gifts. And when the bread and wine come forward now, our church teaches that that's the gift of the people. Then the priest transforms that gift and gives it back to them in Holy Communion. I was in one of our missionary chapels in uh, Cameroon and uh, they were bringing up live chickens, they were bringing <laughs> up peanuts, they were bringing up many interesting gifts, believe me. <laughs> and that's the beauty and you know our Lord gives us so much in our lives and that's the purpose of the gift of the tithe when we bring forward the gift. Uh, if you notice some of the collection to help keep our shrine in operation, uh, that gift is just again 
God gives us so much, so we're bringing it back to Him. And so it's the beautiful gift of exchange, and, and that's what our Lord wants. He wants to be with us. And, you know, this Mass is a, is a communion of community, uh, not just personal prayer, as the Catholics believe, but in community. And that's where the singing unites us in community. This beautiful choir, it's just 100 people in the uh, Northeast Catholic College, but uh, 60 of them are here today. Uh, music is an essential part of the program there, and uh, they just, the, the hand, harmony, the voices, the blending, it's like we're in heaven. It's beautiful. Let's listen again. Yes.
pray, my sisters and brothers, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our healing of all the Holy Church. Accept, O Lord, we pray, the oblations of your people and of those you have brought to new birth that renewed by confession of your name and by baptism, they may attain unending happiness through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, at all times to acclaim you, O Lord. But on this day, above all, to laud you yet more gloriously, when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. For he is the true Lamb who has taken away the sins of the world. By dying he has destroyed our death, and by rising restored our life. Therefore, Overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people exults in your praise. And even the heavenly powers with the angelic host sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. Sanctus, Sanctus, Dominus, Elus, Sabbat, Venis, Uncelli, et Serra, Gloria Tua, Hosanna in excelsis, Benedictus, qui venit in nomine Domini, Hosanna, To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son and Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world. together with your servant, Francis, our Pope, and Mitchell, our Bishop, and all who hold, who holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants, and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you his sacrifice and praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls in hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. Celebrating the most sacred day of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh and in communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, 
your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmos and Damien, and all your saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers, in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family, which we make to you, also for those to whom you have been pleased to give the new birth of water and the Holy Spirit, granting them forgiveness of all their sins. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock you have chosen. Be pleased, O Lord, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands. And with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father, Giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands. And once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the Just the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar in heaven, in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son, may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who, though sinners, hope in abundant mercies, graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, 
Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetual, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon. Through Christ our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, and for my divine teaching, we dare to say, How our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. 
Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. As we prepare to distribute communion here on Mercy Sunday at, on Eden Hill, we'd like to lead you at home in a spiritual communion prayer for those who are homebound who would not be able to receive. And sometimes those who make a spiritual communion prayer obviously can receive the same graces as those who are able to receive at, at church, and sometimes even more powerfully because they want to receive, whereas unfortunately, sometimes when we go to Mass, we just go through the motions. There's a, a powerful uh, prayer in the Diary of St. Faustina, 1447, where Jesus says, Oh, how painful it is to me that souls so seldom unite themselves to me in Holy Communion. I wait for souls, and they are indifferent toward me. I love them tenderly and sincerely, and they distrust me. I want to lavish my graces on them, and they do not want to accept them. They treat me as a dead object, whereas my heart is full of love and mercy. In order that you may know at least some of my pain, imagine the most tender of mothers who has great love for her children, while these children spurn her love. Consider her pain. No one is in a position to console her. This is but a feeble image of my likeness and my love. You know, Father Joe, these words of uh, Jesus to St. Faustina reveal his great desire to unite himself with us in Holy Communion. This is the source and summit of our faith. Um, for our viewers who can't receive Holy Communion right now sacramentally, we encourage you to make a spiritual communion at this time with the following prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the Eucharist. I love you and I desire to receive you into my heart now. Since I can't receive you at this moment sacramentally, please come into my heart in spiritual communion. Amen. Jesus is so generous to us. He wants to share his love with us. Uh, and uh, we open our heart to him as he wants to pour out those graces of Divine Mercy Sunday on, on those who are receiving now here on Eden Hill and those at home who are re receiving spiritually. You know, Father, this is the ultimate transformation. Um, our Lord uh, transformed bread and wine on the altar into the body and blood of Christ, or the Holy Spirit transformed the bread and wine into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. And now when we receive, we ask for that transformation. We ask to be the ones that is transformed into the love of Christ. And you know what? Um, we can see, Father Joe, you, you don't have to look too far in the headlines now to see that our Lord can take even the worst evils and transform them. Look at the example of the cathedral um, in, in France, uh, Notre Dame. You know, we when we heard that on the Monday of East of Holy Week, uh, we were shocked. Um, and uh, what we realize is that our Lord may and it is using this possibly for a greater good to be able to reconcile and people realizing what they could lose just instantly. Something like that you take for granted and, and you suddenly realize you can lose it in an instant. And, and God bless the courage of the priest who went back in and some of those who rescued the relics, the crown of thorns, and the priest who risked his life to receive or to um, uh, take out the Blessed Sacrament. Absolutely. He had said in an interview, everybody understands that the crown of thorns is an absolutely unique and extraordinary relic, but the Blessed Sacrament yes. is our Lord, really present in his body, soul, divinity, and humanity. And you understand that it is hard to see someone you love perish in the blaze. As firefighters 
uh, we often see casualties from fire and we know its effects. This is why I sought to preserve, above all, the real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. And not only did he rescue the Blessed Sacrament from the burning cathedral as the fire engulfed the bell tower, he took the time to perform a benediction before the altar with the Blessed Sacrament. And he said, here, I am completely alone in the cathedral in the middle of a burning debris falling from the ceiling. I call upon Jesus to help us save his home. It was probably both this and the excellent general maneuver of the firefighters that led to the stopping of the fire, the ultimate rescuing of the North Tower and subsequently of the other one. Yeah, it took over 500 of those firefighters of courage and, and, um, and the grace of God to protect them. And you know, Father Joe, as we look on the screen and seeing um, these beloved pilgrims coming forward, um, up the aisle, if you will, even though we're outside, um, you still... You, 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 you look at what is happening here, and if we can just renew our church through the Eucharist, you know, Jesus said that the, the renewal will come through adoration and loving of him in the Blessed Sacrament and devotion of our Blessed Mother. But when you come forward, um, realize what is happening. In the centuries of our church, we've always, uh, the church fathers have talked about the nuptial um, uh, beauty in the, the Mass. You are the bride, and Christ is the groom. And when we come forward, we are in a way the bride coming up the aisle as in a wedding. And she who meets her in a Catholic wedding, who meets her at the altar is her groom. And the two become one. And in this Mass, when you come forward, you are the bride, Christ is the groom, and who's waiting for you at the altar? Your groom. And then what happens? Just like the consummation and wedding, Christ the groom enters into you the bride. It is a beautiful nuptial um, beauty there that, that so few people realize. All we have to do is listen to the church fathers to see this. Yes, Jesus wants to have that intimacy with each one of us. Each one of us is the, is the, uh, the spouse of Christ. Uh, as the church. So let's um, allow Jesus to speak to us during this Holy Communion. Um, he is, the, as you said, the bridegroom. He wants to speak to his bride, so let's open our heart, let's listen to the music, and allow Jesus to speak to us.
Our dear friend Susan Tasson wrote a wonderful new book, Day by Day, with St. Faustina. 365 Reflections came out from uh, Sophia Press. And the uh, um, entry for today, April 28th, is called Drowned in His Mercy, very appropriate with the rain. One, <laughs> one day during Holy Mass, the Lord gave me a deeper knowledge of His holiness and His majesty. And at the same time, I saw my own misery. This knowledge made me happy, and my soul drowned itself completely in His mercy. I felt enormously happy. You know, the, those images of a fountain of mercy, an ocean of mercy, the rain, the drowning in mercy, they're very evocative that the, the Lord's mercy is just, uh, really wants to touch us. Yeah, it is through the Eucharist, Father Joe. Do you know Sister Faustina wrote 16 different prayers uh, based on uh, receiving Holy Communion? And uh, she definitely was focused on that. And uh, the beautiful grace of receiving Holy Communion in those prayers uh, should waken us up to the importance of that. And St. Faustina, you know, um, she even said one of my favorite passages in the diary was she said that, you know, if angels, Jesus actually said to her that if angels were capable of envy, they would only envy man for two reasons. One, that he can suffer and two, that he can receive Holy Communion. Now, what's interesting, Father Joe, one, nobody wants anything to do with, and the other, so few Catholics truly believe in. So just think, the angels would envy us that we can receive Holy Communion and that we can suffer. And the reason is because in Holy Communion, we share uh, the union with God. They do not, angels do not, because they're only spirit. And in suffering, we imitate our Savior on the cross. Wow. So powerful. Wow, that's beautiful. And Father, would uh, you share with us some of the words of the Pope, uh, Holy Father's words uh, today? Well, it was very powerful. Uh, he gave the Regina Chaley message, uh, which is that uh, message you get at uh, Easter time instead of the Angelus. And he talked about three things, three gifts that we receive today on Mercy Sunday, peace, joy, and apostolic mission. Three times we know during the gospel, Jesus said, peace to you. And uh, he, he talked especially about touching the wounds of, of Christ. Uh, Thomas was, was invited to touch the wounds. So in, in his incredulity, he wouldn't, didn't want to believe that Jesus was risen. And Jesus was saying, whatever it takes to convince you, touch my wounds. And the Pope says these wounds, if we're not at peace, we should touch the wounds of Christ because they're a symbol of the world that needs healing. Uh, and so that's a way that we can receive that peace. He also said we need to receive joy today. Joy is part of this Easter message. And then he sends us out on mission, an apostolic mission. He doesn't. He wants to receive this mercy so that we can share it with others. Absolutely. And if you were with us during the pre-show, that was the focus at the end. And um, I did a talk here yesterday, Father Joe, to the um, to the Marian helpers here on the grounds of Stockbridge, and it was packed. And the theme was basically I've walked through the mass, and I really emphasize the end of mass because we we looking at our our watches we're looking at our you know our stomachs are growling we want to go and we just want to get out and it, this is the wrong wrong approach what is happening at the mass is we're being sent the words of the end of the mass go and announce the gospel of the lord go in peace this is and as i said earlier in the show uh, the latin ite missi est which is go she is being sent meaning we are called and I, I read something beautiful father joe that said what most parishes are lacking today is that they assume that the people in the pew are evangelized mm -hmm. and john paul said you know you don't have to go to africa anymore you you can evangelize the the person next to you in the pew and what most parishes are missing is the fact that we first have to evangelize the, 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 the people in the pew to teach them why they want to give their life to Christ. Two, we have to make them disciples. And the word disciple means to learn. But then after you become a disciple and you learn about God, you want to make them an apostle. And the word apostle means to be sent. Yes. So God bless the Holy Father for pointing out that essence today because that's the mission of the Mass. The Mass means dismissal. And, um, and we are to be sent just as the Holy Father said. And Bishop Scharfenberger even said today said that the it, yeah. uh, apostles weren't completely evangelized. Yes. What, there was nothing missing in what Jesus said to yes. them, but their hearts were not completely open yes. to receive the good news until the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit came, and then they were convicted, and then they were on fire. Absolutely, and this is what we have to do. This is why the Holy Spirit is such a key, and the Holy Spirit is what, you know, how do we know God the Father? We know God the Father through the Son. If we look at the face of Jesus in the image of divine mercy, that's the face of the Father's mercy. But how do we know the Son? We know the Son through the Holy Spirit. Jesus said you cannot know the Son if you don't know the Spirit, if you don't know who He is. So how do we know the Spirit? 
We know the Spirit through His spouse, Mary. So if you want to get back to God the Father, which is our ultimate goal, go back the exact same way you came from. Start with Mary. She leads you to the Holy Spirit. Go to the Holy Spirit. He teaches you and shows you who Jesus is, and then Jesus reveals to us the mercy of the Father. Beautiful. Just give you a quick quote from the Pope this morning. On this second Sunday of Easter, we are invited to approach Christ with faith, opening our hearts to peace, joy, and mission. But let's not forget the wounds of Jesus, because peace, joy, and strength for the mission come from there. We entrust this prayer to the maternal intercession of the Virgin Mary, Queen of Heaven and Earth. And we can't forget Mary's role in this. You know, uh, Father Joe, a lot of people think Mary detracts us. Uh, Non-Catholics believe that Mary detracts from Jesus or distracts us, and that's nothing could be more from the truth. She leads us. Nobody knows Jesus more than his mother, and she can transform us like she transformed him in the womb into another Christ if we let her. She's not offensive to God. He's his, she's his mother, and so we have to utilize this. And Father Joe, before we wrap up here, we want to talk about again the graces that St. Faustina promised um, in 699 of the diary that the soul that has been to confession and it receives Holy Communion will receive this great grace. And Father Joe, it's important because a lot of times we get asked, oh, I'm confused, Father, is this a plenary indulgence? Yes, the church did offer a plenary indulgence on this day. So if you do the normal conditions of a plenary indulgence, which is the Indulgence Act, which today you could do um, venerating the image, praying the chaplet, uh, doing an act of mercy, along with the four conditions that normally apply to a plenary indulgence, which is having been to confession. And as you know, Father Joe, a lot of the old timers remember eight days, but since the Jubilee year 2000, the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith has said about 20 days to receive, your uh, to go to confession before or after. Right. You then receive Holy Communion, and then you pray for the intentions of the Holy Father, which you can with our Father, Hail Mary, Glory Be. but. It's that last condition that kind of is difficult, and that is no attachment to sin, even venial. That's okay. We keep working at it, and even if our indulgence isn't plenary, which means full, it's at least partial. Now, that's a beautiful thing, and you can do that today and offer that for a holy soul. But today is given a special grace called the Extraordinary Promise. That is, Jesus is giving us the same grace as a plenary indulgence, which is the complete forgiveness of sin and all punishment. But Father Joe, here's the difference. He doesn't put any restrictions on it other than confession and communion. Yep. And any of us can go to confession and communion. In other words, Father Joe, as I always say, it's not a magic wand or a rabbit's foot. It's just Jesus wanting us to go back to the sacraments. Okay. And this grace we call the extraordinary promise is for ourselves. We right. can't offer that no, up no, for anyone. No. And, and, the, and the key is to have the faith, to yes. believe that we that Jesus wants to give that to us, open our heart, and we can receive it. Yes. Uh, and, and he's so generous to us. So, and so, as we said earlier, don't miss out on the graces that he wants to give. They're gifts offered to us. He wants to give it. Let's open our heart to receive them. Very good. And let us now continue hearing the beautiful music.
Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that our reception of this Paschal Sacrament may have a continuing effect in our minds and hearts through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Today, bring to me all mankind, especially all sinners, and immerse them in the ocean of my mercy. In this way, you will console me in the bitter grief into which the loss of souls plunges me. Most merciful Jesus, whose very nature it is to have compassion on us and to forgive us, do not look upon our sins, but upon our trust, which we place in your infinite goodness. Receive us all into the abode of your most compassionate heart, and never let us escape from it. We beg this of you, by your love which unites you to the Father and the Holy Spirit. Eternal Father, turn your merciful gaze upon all mankind, and especially upon poor sinners, all enfolded in the most compassionate heart of Jesus. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, show us your mercy, that we may praise the omnipotence of your mercy forever and ever. Amen. You expired, Jesus, but the source of life gushed forth for souls, and the ocean of mercy opened for the whole world. O fount of life, unfathomable divine mercy, envelop the whole world and empty yourself out upon us. O blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus, as the fount of mercy for us, I trust in you. O blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus as a fount of mercy for us, I trust in you. O blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus as a fount of mercy for us, I trust in you. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We give us this day our daily bread. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and the hour of our death. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. <laughs> Amen. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, so and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, my Lord Jesus Christ. In atonement for our sins and those of the whole world, for the sake of this sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the world. For the sake of this sorrowful passion, have mercy on.
Eternal God, in whom mercy is endless and the treasury of compassion inexhaustible, look kindly upon us and increase your mercy in us that in difficult times we may not despair nor become despondent, 
but with great confidence submit ourselves to your holy will, which is love and mercy itself. Amen. pray. Lord our God, in this great sacrament, we come into the presence of Jesus Christ, your Son, born of the Virgin Mary and crucified for our salvation. May we who declare our faith in this fountain of love and mercy Drink from it the water of everlasting life. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Well, this was a powerful Divine Mercy Sunday today, and it was made especially so by the presence of uh, the a relic of St. John Vianney. He was a holy man, he lived a holy life, and he helped to bring about renewal in France after the French Revolution because of the holiness of his life and spending all that time hearing confessions. And that's the beauty of confession, Father. Um, you know, so much of our society today feels there's no need for confession. I'm not a sinner. I haven't killed anybody, so how do I need this priestly confessional thing? It's not in the Bible. Well, actually it is. If we read this scripture passage, from today. It was the first Divine Mystery Sunday when Jesus entered into the upper room and bestowed on them and breathed on the apostles. And the only other time that God breathed on man was at creation. He breathed the new life and he said, whose sins you forgive are forgiven, whose sins you retain are retained. Matthew 16, 19, Matthew 18, 18, John 20, 23. He says this. And so, Father, when we go to the confessional and that priest says, I absolve you, you are guaranteed forgiveness, yeah. or Jesus' grant of that authority would be meaningless. Right. And so we have Christ who had the ultimate authority to forgive sin, but he delegated that authority to the priest. And the priest, people say, well, Father, the priest doesn't forgive sins. Of course, the grace comes from God, but the priest does forgive those sins per Christ's command right. in this scripture passage for today's reading. Yeah, yeah. So how beautiful is that? There's a beautiful uh, painting uh, by my friend Tommy Canning from Scotland where we see that the priest is hearing the uh, confession, but it's really Jesus yes. is standing behind him, and the rays are pouring forth through the priest. So the priest is the instrument, but it's really Jesus who's forgiving Absolutely. the sins. Absolutely, and I use the um, that pe that picture, and um, we you know we see also in Saint Faustina saying that confession. This is a very powerful line in the in the diary, that is not just for forgiveness, but it's also for healing and for education. Mm -hmm. So the priest can help us. This is why uh, we have to pray for our priest, as Faustina said so that they can better understand us but they can educate us on things that we don't even know our sins but when we can go into that confessional and receive healing we're right back at the the message of our, our show today yeah. and that is the healing message of God's power to be able to say Lord I am broken yeah. I do need to be able to be healed and this message of healing power um, today it can reach the whole corners of the globe um, through television as we said today through through uh, movies through books books, uh, through radio, through retreats, and even the web as we finish, but we apologize we didn't have a time to put another guest on about the about the internet, but the web gives us also so many beautiful tools to be able to use and spread this message. So please visit our website, thedivinemercy.org slash EWTN. If you've missed any part of this program, Father Joe, um, we really, really would love you to go back. I to think we want to go back to the bishop now. Oh, okay. Blessed be your name, O Lord. You are the fount of source and source of every blessing. And you look with delight upon the devout practices of the faithful. Draw near, we pray, to these your servants. And as they use these symbols of their faith and devotion, grant that they may also strive to be transformed into the likeness of Christ your Son, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May these devotional articles be blessed and may those who use them with faith receive the assurance of divine grace and protection in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God, alleluia, alleluia.
want to thank all our viewers for looking in today. We have received an abundance of graces. Jesus has poured graces out on us in a multiple, a mul a multitude of ways, the rain and, and many other ways as well. <laughs> and if you've missed any of this or some of this program and you'd like to see it again, please tune in to our website, thedivinemercy.org slash EWTN. And our website can also, you can get information on today's guests and any other related stories. Or for more information, please call us at 800 four six two seven four two six that's eight hundred four marion and father joe once again thank you for a great show and let us go out and live and announce the gospel of the lord absolutely uh we just have a couple of minutes left so just as we're wrapping up you you had mentioned before the cure of ours he was a great confessor it reminds me also of padre pio who was a great confessor and they both ended up fighting the evil one because he <laughs> knew how important those confessions were and so we want these catholics out there all our friends don't overlook that sacrament of confession. It's a powerful, powerful yeah. source of grace. Get to confession regularly. We Marians are called to do so every couple of weeks. Yes. And so our lay people could go to so regularly as well and receive the graces from it. Yeah, a good, a good uh, a, a theory is going once a month. That yeah. way you're covered yeah. under the plenary sure. indulgence, uh, sure. both before and after. And, you know, again, as we mentioned earlier, this is the reason why Jesus gave this gift of uh, divine mercy promise was to return us to the sacraments um, of, holy, of confession and holy communion and um, again it's nothing secret there's not a magical thing here well there is in the mystery but um, our Lord has asked us to make sure that we return to the sacraments and today is the way to do that and again if you are in any way shape or form wondering am I doing all I can do for the Lord what can I do more how can I share in this message of mercy please join us in the association today there's no cost there's usually we charge a small tiny administrative fee to be able to cover the cost of the administration not today. We would love to send you this beautiful family blessing and be able to send to you a gift of God's mercy through the association where you share in all of our spiritual benefits, our prayers, our masses, our sacrifices, just as if you were a Marian father of the Immaculate Conception. And Father Joe, who doesn't need that grace today? Well, we want to all share in the graces and share in the prayers. I mean, we every day we're called to offer the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. We pray morning prayer, evening prayer together as communities every day. And, and the lay people can share in our mission. Yes. They pray for us, we pray for them, and yep. that's how it works. And if you can't be the hands and the feet out there going to Africa and Asia, we are. So you can support us and we can be the hands and feet and God accepts that grace just the same. So that's the way it works. It's a collaborative effort here. We're working with the lay people and we're working with the Lord and he's pouring the mercy out on us and we're trying to share it. Very good. Uh, everybody's uh, waving, so uh, I think it's it's time to say goodbye. Thank you so much for all that uh, you do for us. Uh, we want to thank our people at EWTN and all the, the local crew. They, they just, to help get that message out and to communicate it, it's been wonderful. Thanks, Father Chris. Let's say goodbye, and God bless you. We'll see you again next year on Mercy Sunday. And thank you to all our viewers, and God bless you all. <laughs>